Welcome, everyone, uh, and welcome to our first event to kick off World Space Week here at the Australian National University. I'm joining you live from our media, stu uh, media studio with Professor Anna Moore. And tonight I am here both in my capacity as Vice Chancellor, but also just a little bit as astronomer, noting we're talking about space, and space and astronomy are, are not exactly the same, but they sure are related. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet uh, this evening and whose airwaves uh, we're broadcasting across. Pay my respects to elders past and present here uh, on, on our campus in Acton. Uh, it's the Ngunnawal Nambri people. We also have some time tonight for a live Q&A at the end with, a, with the audience. So please submit your question in the comments section in YouTube, if you would, and we'll do our best to uh, get in and ask those questions. Anna, thank you very much for joining us here tonight. Now, I've known Anna Moore for a long time, but let me introduce you to her. Uh, uh, she is director of the ANU Institute for Space, known as InSpace, uh, and is the head of the ANU Advanced Instrumentation Technology Center. Uh, before coming to ANU as professor, Anna was at Caltech in the United States, where she worked with major players in the global space industry, including NASA and the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. Her expertise continues to be sought, uh, be sought after around the world. And when she arrived in Australia, she was asked to join the panel of expert reference group, and I'll let her tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and through this work, uh, she has been able to identify many opportunities for promising space research and was instrumental in establishing the Institute for Space to help our research here, researchers here at ANU support Australia and in its innovations, its technology and economy amongst everything else, hopefully to create a strong future for Australia by utilizing the amazing things that are possible uh, from space. So Anna, great to, uh, to be with you here once again. I'd like to just start off, if it's okay, telling us just a little bit about your journey that has you the head of Australia's leading um, space research uh, and space industry uh, uh, center within uh, the ANU. Um, so it's great to be here, Brian. Thank you. Um, so I've always been interested in space since the age of four, since the age of my mother trying to find out where I was at night in the northeast of England and having to get me down from the roof. Looking at the clouds. Looking yes. at the clouds and maybe just see the stars. So, um, you know, I've always really been fascinated by space and always knew I'd be working in it. But I'll fast track to the last three years. And so um, there I was in Caltech, very happy, content what I was doing and saw this great uh, opportunity in Australia to come back and lead a, a fantastic astronomy instrumentation center on Mount Stromlo. Um, and pretty s as soon as I got back, um, I was asked by um, Arthur Sinodinus um, to join a committee of six people, chaired by Megan Clark, um, to advise the federal government on what Australia's space capability was and um, what were the opportunities for growth for Australia and its space industry community as well. And this was just an amazing experience for me to come into that, to see the major players and to see what Australia was doing, where it could go and what ANU could, could do in this landscape as well. Yeah. So just going back to the beginning, so we started off in England. Now mm -hmm. you were uh, an undergraduate at Cambridge. Cambridge. What did you study there? Because I want to try to get... Well, so it was called natural science, just to confuse everyone. Yeah. But uh, that was it, it, physics. And did you yes. know you wanted to do space then, or were you doing some other aspect oh, of yes. physics? Oh, yes, absolutely. Right? So, so astronomy at the end. And then I know you moved to Australia, because I knew you when I moved to Australia a long time ago. Yeah. So what did you do your PhD in? So I built a telescope um, in Narrabri, northern New South Wales. So I spent a lot of time in northern New South Wales. Um, right. And this was... Um, a real change in track for me because I wasn't an engineer. I, yeah. I really wanted to do something hands-on. Um, and um, so this was a really, really big change for me to do that. Um, so I learned a lot and worked with some great people and built my own telescope in, uh, in Narrabri. Yeah, so you came. And how did you decide to make the big trip from England to go study at the University of Sydney? 
Oh, that was easy. So that was a Brit coming to Australia. Yeah, okay. So it was like... <laughs> okay, good. No, no, I mean, I, got, I, was, I was very lucky. I got a scholarship to come um, to study at um, University of Sydney at a great department there, a yeah. really good supervisor doing exactly what I wanted to do. So, you know, the, the universe aligned. And it is quite remarkable if you think about it. Uh, and this is the way astronomy and space science is, is that here I am, different place, you know, Canberra as opposed to Sydney, mm -hmm. moved from the other side of the planet, also moved to Australia to do this. And yet I knew Anna when, you know, uh, she started and when I started here as a postdoc. And that sort of tells you the scale of, mm -hmm. of how things were. It's bigger now, though. Uh, how, does it, how do you think it's changed in the time since when you arrived here in the late 90s, I'm guessing? Um, well, I can tell you how much it's changed in the last three years. Yep. Never mind since the 90s. And so, so now we're, we're talking about space, not just astronomy, but, but moving into space itself, which is very multidisciplinary, yep. right? It's, it matters for what we do in our daily lives, not just finding the furthest things in the universe, but, but so it matters what we do every day. So how does it matter That's for changed. the average Australian? So why should the average Australian uh, worry about what you're trying to do in space? What are some of the things you're trying to do that they can relate to? So um, there's two ways to answer that. So I think, I think um, uh, people don't, even three years ago, people don't realize what they depend upon with space assets, so um, not just navigation, your phone, um, communications, um, uh, defense, sovereign assets, uh, space situational awareness, agriculture, you know, it w even three years ago it was already starting to use space assets to be able to, whether it's um, save money, do things more quickly, get to re communicate to remote locations, for example. So that was all happening then. I just don't think most people were aware of that segment of what we use, you know. Um, they, they, I think the, uh, the public were much more sort of um, told about the, the, the shuttles and the, the journeys for humans into space and the astronomy and the planetary, you know, the rovers going on Mars. That's usually what most people would think about when, they th when you mention space and space industry. Um, but there's a whole layer of things happening underneath that, even three years ago. That, that, that was the case. But what's happened since then? So, exactly. I mean, the ex the, the, I think a lot of it's to do with just the cheaper access. So the Elon Musk catalyst, whatever you want to call it, and others too. So just having that cheaper access has changed everything. So it used to be um, the domain of uh, those who had the money, the, the governments, yeah. the state labs, the NASA's, the ESA's, the things like this. It was wondrous, it was fantastic, it was inspirational, but it wasn't something um, even an individual university or a small company or a person could, could feel they had, um, they could do something, you know, that would help them, do you know what I mean? It was a long way away, but that, that access has is, is got a lot cheaper. Um, it can be part of a business plan now mm -hmm. for a small company to be able to do something, and that's where it's changed. And so the access, of course, is having these cheap rockets, but mm -hmm. it's also, if you think about how many CubeSats you could put on a Saturn V, mm -hmm. it was, would have been a lot. So it's the whole scale of things, right? Being it able has. to work at small scale. There's a lot more. Um, I think it's a, good, it's a culmination of a technology advancing at a time when access has gotten a lot cheaper. Yeah. And so there's a lot more concentration now in what we call low Earth orbit space, so right very close to the Earth. Uh, think of large numbers of constellations, or even, which could be just two or three, but so constellations... So constellations, explain what that means to the so audience. So a constellation here is where you have multiple smaller satellites working in unison, yep. in a way. And they replace a single asset, which could be a billion dollars, for example, positioned somewhere much further away. So it's cheaper to do things in this low Earth orbit so in a constellation. So you one. can imagine SkyMuster, where there's two of them, billion mm -hmm. dollars plus, being replaced by with dozens or hundreds of yes. low Earth uh, Wi-Fi satellites, effectively. Exactly. Yes, kind of screws up, screws up the night sky for us astronomers, uh, but pretty useful uh, from that type of thing. That's right. So, when we look at Australia's capability, uh, okay, all sounds good, but mm -hmm. what do we bring to the table 
that you know other countries don't why aren't we just sort of a johnny come lately i know we you know for me born in 1967 reset went mm -hmm. off in 1967 mm -hmm. and that was the the first satellite launched uh from australia and i think we were the after uh, uh russia and the u.s the third country to launch something mm -hmm. sovereign mm -hmm. and then it's been kind of cricket since so what do we have to bring what 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 are why are we interest interesting in this space so um as part of the this expert reference group we the, the group itself read all these submissions from industry public institutions etc um and we were even though we knew a lot of the capability that was coming in but what people were doing not yeah. just what they could do what they were doing um, and but we were able, we were really blown away at what the possibilities were, and so um, we can start with Australia's its location and its size. So its size being its range in longitude and latitude. It's a huge country, and its location is quite unique. Yeah. And so for two areas, communications, satellite communications, deep space communications, optical communications, the next generation of communications as well as what's called space situational awareness. Sometimes it's called space domain awareness in the more defense community. So you're going to have to translate that for everyone. So yeah. this is, um, as we start to populate space, especially in low Earth orbit, it's important that we know what's up there, what it's doing, is there, are there any, just like you would with aircraft, you know, yep. you want to be able to know what's up there, what they're doing, are there any possible collision issues Etc. 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 And that starts getting really important now. And so when I that's was a, what this is. So when I was a kid, so let's just talk a little bit about that and mm. just give some depth to it. So space situational awareness, still knowing where people things are orbiting. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a kid, NORAD went through and had this big uh, radar thing, mm -hmm. and it just bounced radio signals off and keeps and still does a huge catalog. Is that sufficient? Not anymore. So, yeah. so that needs to be well. Um, that catalog um, uh, is being offloaded, or they, the U.S. would like to offload that into a more commercial venture, actually. And so, um, so we're in the process now. The, the global community is in the process of deciding how do we do that most effectively, and not just how, but. Um, be able to make decisions also, that's really important. It's not just about the technology of knowing, okay, something's there, something's there, something's there. It's more than that now. So so it's it's uh, all about regulation as well. So you need to be able to look holistically. But we're getting off track a bit. So what, what does Australia have? Yeah. That's really important. So simply through its geography and where it is, these two civil and defense domains, communications and space situational awareness, which has multiple billion dollars of investment, you know, even just from the Australian government into the future, yep. Australia's got a huge part to play there. Even starting from, as you say, maybe scratch. It's not yep. quite starting from scratch, but that's just through its geography and its location. And this is one of the places where, uh, if I think about uh, when Mount Stromwell burned to the ground in mm -hmm. 2003, there was a brand new facility up there that had a laser run by Electro Optic Systems, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. works with AMU, among other things. Uh, and that was for that, and that's mm -hmm. different than radar. Are there advantages mm -hmm. to using lasers for doing this? I mean, mm -hmm. radar is nice, it goes through clouds, but mm -hmm. what are the advantages of doing things, and how did that, you know, what's the, what are the, why has Australia been one of the first places to emerge with that type of technology? So I think, um, so Australia's R&D in, in the uh, lasers and in optics is quite, you know, is, is quite good it always yep. has been for many years and I think it's leveraging that R&D community both in industry and in the universities um, and so um, why do you want to use optical um, to do this kind of monitoring well it gives you better accuracy essentially yep. it gives you instant accuracy the the error circle on those satellites is so much smaller if you use optical sensors and if you use radar in, in reality you use or you always use both Use both to yeah. try to go it, so you can presumably Absolutely. just shooting a laser is tough. Radar kind of goes up there, but if we think about what an orbit looks like, if you're the space station, we know a couple of weeks ago we had to move the space station mm -hmm. because the thing was coming within 1.6 k 
kilometers mm -hmm. a mile, plus or minus a mile. Mm -hmm. Uh, and with uh, presumably with the combination, instead of being that uncertain, you can nail it down. So maybe you don't have to move the space station if you know where the things are more accurate. That's right. So yeah. if you ha if you have multiple locations where you're observing something from, that yep. that reduces that error circle. And often it's quite a global thing as well. Yep. So you have sensors all around the planet doing the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about the other aspects of communication. I mean, I think most people in Australia realize that. We're home of Tidman Villa mm -hmm. and Parks. Uh, obviously, the moon landing done at Parks. Mm -hmm. uh, people who go out to Tidman Villa realize it does a lot of the heavy lifting for NASA of communicating to its most distant probes. Mm -hmm. Why Australia? Why don't they use Goldstone or the uh, one in Spain? They do. Well, they do. But they seem to use Tidman Villa more. <laughs> So, um, well, to get that 24-hour coverage, because yep. you're looking at the same place in the sky and the Earth rotates, and so you need to have at least those three main locations to be able to give 24-hour um, coverage to a probe landing on Mars or going to the moon or something like that. So those, those locations are very critical, and Australia has always been um, a major observing point in the Southern Hemisphere for NASA. So um, if we go through and look at some of the other, uh, I guess, exciting technologies, anything you want to give me a sense of things that you think are going to happen where you think we do have that little edge of things we could look forward to? Gosh, there's not enough time here to go through uh, them well, all. Give us a taste okay. of the top <laughs> okay. three liquid all sorts. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Um, so um, I think in the area of, so the area in quantum optics, metrology, lasers, I'm going to put all that together, although... I'm sure a lot of people will not like that, but but that is very strong in Australia, yep. and um, and I think I think that's one of its major strengths, research strengths, industry strengths, and we'll just see that taking off because it's new as well. So it's always good when something is new to be right there at the beginning, yep. rather than coming in late on something when you're 50 years behind everyone else. But this is that's not the case with this. So um, I think that's that's super cool. So I'm thinking of things like how do we encode lasers with information and do it in a secure way? How do we measure um, precision with precision satellite spacing uh, and separations in the future, not just for constellations, but also for gravitational wave measurements in the future? So doing astronomy from space. To doing astronomy. Types of things, right? how, how do we use that to, to measure bulk water movement? You know, using things like the NASA so Grace you think follow you could one mission. Potentially Super get cool. in and and actually measure how much water is in the Murray Darling Darling Basin, for example. Uh, well, so that's th so the hints of that are already being done yep. by researchers here at A and U. Yep. Which is which is great, but it's the next step using lasers to be able to do that, and so that's not being done. And that gives you the advantage of being able to better understand yes. what's going on and, and, and manage the water, so things like that. That's okay, right. so lots of really interesting things. So I guess part of my sense is I almost feel like with these little cube sets and the price, as you say, that it's, it's almost like a platform, like a iPhone app is. So do you think there's going to be all sorts of emergent things that are just completely left field that suddenly we're going to be able to do that are just new industries entirely that are oh, for based sure. on this? For sure. So it's I mean, not going to just be the same old stuff. It's going to be just no. brand new things. Yeah, well, this, this is the great part of what's happening in space now because it's getting down to almost the individual. Yep. And so anyone who's, it's like, mm -hmm. I guess MacGyver's too old a show to be saying to people today, but I used to watch a show called MacGyver when I was growing oh, up. I remember it Do you well. remember it? Okay. Oh, of course. All right, I was awesome. Okay, so um, it's like everyone can be a MacGyver now in space. You've got, you've got a great idea. You have access to those platforms now. And you marry that with things like new developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's totally blank space yeah. for everyone. And, and for people who don't remember MacGyver or too young, <laughs> MacGyver used to take random household elements and yeah. create a nuclear bomb right. from uh, a, a match. And, a paper clip uh, and a... And some duct tape. Yeah. Yes. So That's right. it, was, it was an entertaining show. Okay, so you were involved in the creation of the Space Agency through this uh, group you were on. Mm -hmm. So is that really important? Uh, for creating the industry and what Australia is going to do, or is it really just a, a tack on that sounds good, but really it's going to happen anyway? 
no, I mean, it has been. It has been completely influential to have that front door to Australia's space capability, and it matters. Um, we, we all knew it did at the time, and we all celebrated when plans for the space agency were announced months before you yep. know, we'd actually published our results and things like that. Everyone was really happy about it. But to watch how the rest of the world reacted to that, you know, all of a sudden you've got that federal government front door to what Australia is doing in space. And that really, really matters. So how does it matter? What is it, what is it you know, well, uh, it, how do you see so it opening up things in Australia? Well, it, it already has. Yeah. You know, so, um, it, you know, one of the things that we heard about on the ERG were ERG the expert reference group, I'm sorry, yeah. was um, from um, outside players. Which they're commenting on, we, you know, there's, there's five different, just hypothetically, there's five different groups we're dealing with right now. Yeah. Right? And each one is a different relationship, even just an, from an MOU perspective, a, a, a memorandum perspective, a piece of paper that you write to say you're both interested in doing something. They had to have different ones for every single player. There was no one, you know, uh, being that central coordinator of things like that. And this matters for when you're talking about NASA and ESA and JAXA. These are the international space agencies. You know, they're very hesitant to do deals with specific institutions. It's hard for them to do that. So even just, so, so you've now got this huge base in Australia who wants to do something in space. And you've got that access now to get out into the global markets, and I think that's really important. And so do you think that will help keep Australia from fragmenting? One of the problems I find with Australian science, or especially mm -hmm. its research, is we tend to fragment, and Melbourne's going to do this, and Sydney's going to do this, and Adelaide's going to do this, and we all fight over it, and we end up with kind of peanuts each and no big thing. So is the space agency going to kind of bring us together to Team Australia the same way NASA brings USA to Team USA? Um, I think it's on all of us to do that. Yeah, so it's not. I don't think we just rely on one agency to do it. I mean, their success is our success. I think you have right. to look at it like that. And do you think that's important? Very important. Yeah. All right, so um, what are we doing a a as our part of, of that ecosystem here as a part of InSpace? I mean, tell us about some of the things that uh, we're doing at InSpace. So, um, so InSpace is a multidisciplinary institute. It's our front door to ANU for space, like the agency is for Australia. So yeah. you can kind of think of it like that. But it's more than that, though. So, um, so ANU has something that blew me away when I came here was seeing the breadth of capability I I at this university. Um, but it's also small enough to yeah. get across it too, to cut through cut through those colleges and be able to work together holistically. Yeah. So you can. So, for example, um, one of the projects we, we're, um, we're doing is that happened when we joined um, a bushfire expert who didn't know any, who w wasn't doing anything with space assets and would never have thought about doing a satellite to do what she does. Yep. When we teamed her with someone in, it might actually Mount Stromlo, who doesn't know anything about bushfires but knows a lot about infrared sensors because that person used them for astronomy reasons. Yeah. And you put those two people together with a group around them, and InSpace was then able to also get these two people out to the agency and out to the Canadian Space Agency, talking to NASA as well, to make sure we're not reinventing the wheel here. And so we were able to um, identify a new way to do bushfire mitigation, for example, right. which was... Which was you know, something that each of those researchers wouldn't have been able to do before. And so the idea um, is to go in and detect. So fires emit in the infrared, so that if you get a bushfire, you'll be able to see it in the infrared more easily than otherwise. Or oh, this. So this particular project was to actually was to don't wait around until you get a fire. Okay. Yes. You need to know where it's going to happen. Yep. Australia is a huge country. Okay. So you can't just wait around and oh, there's a fire right in the middle of this forest, we'll just send a you know, fire truck in. It doesn't work that way. And so you need to have some idea of where your hotspots are. And so that's where this was, this, this was opening something, else, something new in. Right, and being able to, uh, so Marta, the, the Marta who's here in the Fenner School, mm -hmm. I know she can use IR to also figure just how much moisture stress the exactly. things are under. So she'll know which ones are hot kindling, which ones are going to burn a little slower. Yeah. That's right, exactly. Okay, so. We also have um, 
so in space is, is uh, its researchers, its mission specialists, as they, as they call themselves. Yes. So we have a team of 22 researchers across the university, everyone from economy um, to, uh, to space law, uh, regulation, to the sciences, health and medicine, everything. So we have 22 very diverse mission <coughs> specialists. That was the name yep. they call themselves. Um, and um, so we're leading um, Australia's first optical ground station um, network. Tell um, me what that means. So What's an optical ground station? So, so, to, um, so a ground station is a receiver on the ground that's able to receive signals from space and be able to relay those to where they need to go. Um, but this, what's special about this one is that it covers Australia, so there are nodes all over Australia, yep. and they receive optical signals. And, and that's important because the next generation of communications, high bandwidth, unhackable, this is what the global community wants to do. We're doing that here in Australia, leading the world in doing that. So is the basic the idea is that a satellite will shoot a laser that encodes the signal, Yes. noting that's like a fiber optic, but the beautiful thing in air is you don't need the, the fiber, you just shoot it straight down. Yes. And how fast of communications can you do with a laser? It's 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 the same as a fiber, right? It's like yes. literally gigabit. That's right. So what ter well, terabit? Terabit. If, if it's really low Earth orbit, to. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, imagine a terabit. You only need a few seconds, and bam, you've got everything That's you right. need. And if you do this from low Earth orbit, of course, you don't have the latency. Yeah. So uh, you know, most people put, understand this. What sometimes when you're getting signals and they bounce off geostationary. Yeah. Um, satellites, there is that delay. Light's fast, but it's not well, fast enough. Well, as someone who grew so up in Alaska, in Alaska, we used to have a satellite link for all our phone calls and you know it's it's uh, four four trips of 24,000 right. miles so it's almost a second in the end so you notice it yeah. and so you really notice it and when you're trying to play a video game <laughs> and you've got a second latency in your uh, connection not fun my my children definitely complain about it right. and of course that's a, an issue if you think about something again like the the NBN satellites, while they're really good at getting into the remote areas, the latency, of course, yes. is is I think it's 600 milliseconds or yes. something like that. So it's it's a lot. Yes. And there's just nothing you can do about it. So I guess that means that if you're wanting to get interested in space, it isn't just being an astronaut anymore. No. Literally, you've just said economics. You mm -hmm. said law. I mean, it's is it pretty much anything? It is. Is going to intersect with space? Absolutely. So Absolutely. do you have any ideas if you're, imagine you're uh, in year 10, uh, you're kind of good at a bit of this and that, what would you, what would you recommend? What do you, what should you study to get involved in space? Well, you can, you can study anything. Yep. So, and you can end up with a career in space. That's, that's the, that's the single message. I mean, I always recommend you study what you want to study, but the good thing about the space industry is that it's, it's very broad. And yeah. so, um, so for anyone, it's not just STEM anymore, although, of course, STEM careers are very important yeah. for space um, uh, missions and things like that. But it's not just about that anymore. And it, it's probably helpful to have some of the, the math and um, analytical capacities, even if you're going to do law or something, so you can do, bring the two together. It is, but I think vice versa, too. I think what we'll start yeah. to see potentially is a broader... Um, discipline bases, you know what I mean? So uh, some of the most fascinating conversations we have at InSpace are when we have those group discussions. It's all fine saying you've got a piece of technology that's going to change the world, um, but try and sell that to someone who's, from, who's an economist and try and sell that to someone who's from law where they say, have you thought about what this can do? And I think that's that's a, that's a really interesting dynamic that we have in the Institute. So, so let's just put a little texture around these mm -hmm. things. So let's say I'm a space lawyer. Mm -hmm. What am I thinking about? What am I doing? Uh, so Can't we just keep the lawyers out of space, please? Well, I hope not, because I think, you know, I think without the right frameworks underneath you, legal frameworks underneath you, you can't grow in, you, you can't grow in industry sustainably. Yeah. So, so I think it's very important that the legal and regulatory side and the economic side of space keeps up with the technological advances that are a bit more easier to focus on without thinking about all, all the rest. So if we're going to do things responsibly, I think, I think that's very important. So do you see things, for example, of 
what happens when one rocket collides with another rocket? That's a legal issue in space, potentially? It's, it's certainly an insurance stuff. issue. Yeah, well, <laughs> so yeah. If, we're, if we're thinking about business cases, I mean, yeah. how, you, know, you know, which these kind of things become very important. How do you know? You know, yeah. so, um, yeah, it's, it's a very different laboratory, isn't it? Right. Okay. Interesting. So tell us about some of the facilities we have uh, here at ANU. So you've talked about the, 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 the expertise, but uh, I mean, people may or may not know we have obviously lots of telescopes and stuff, but mm -hmm. space, it's a little different. What do we have in space? So, space? Um, so we host the uh, national, what's called the National Space Test Facilities. Yep. And um, they're, um, so we use these, this is about $130 million worth of infrastructure. Um, that's been built over many years, um, and um, uh, so we use this to simulate space. So we work with industry, and we have a partnership where um, any Australian industry can come in and have access to that for free, yep. um, and they're able to bring their spacecraft and to Ma the Mount Stromlo facilities, and we're able to create the space environment, everything but gravity. Basically, we can we can simulate. And we can also simulate the uh, what it's like to be on the rocket going up into space and making sure your satellite doesn't fall to pieces. Okay, so let's just go break so those into pieces. I think people will be interested in it. Uh -huh. So you say simulate space. So, so what's it mean? Okay, so it's a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Well, space is a harsh environment. So yeah. if you're in low Earth orbit, you not only have, you've got to survive the rocket trip yeah. up um, into space, which is, you know, has quite a lot of um, accelerations and forces yeah. that you have to be able to, you know, to show that you can survive. All right, so That's the that first means, bit. so how do we do that? So how do so we, we have test a, that? So we have a shaker, t what's called a shaker table okay. in the Mount Stromlo facilities, and people attach their, usually they come along with an engineering model first, because you yeah. don't want to shake to bits your final model. So you put your engineering model on the shaker table and it does all its thing. It runs through all the so different frequencies, <laughs> literally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you turn it around and you do the other axis. See if you have the Tacoma Narrows bridge problem <laughs> on your uh, piece of equipment. That's exactly it. Yeah, that yeah. was where there was a reson reson yeah. resonant uh, frequency and it came apart. So mm -hmm. we have one of those. We have one of those. Okay. We have also you ever have seen anything come apart on it yet? Oh, it's usually things like screws and stuff like that, little things. So, uh, yeah. but no, we've not had from we've, big thing. Well, we've not had things, massive explosions. Grow, yeah? okay, no, no, good. no, no, no. Um, yeah. So we have that. Then we have a very large, what's called thermal vacuum chamber. Yep. So this is three meters across. So any satellite that's up to three meters can go in. Yep. Which is which is pretty big. It's a big. Yeah. That. That's big. So it's it's three meters across, Diameter. and it's about five or six so meters long. Yeah, that's right. And so, and so you can make a vacuum, but you said thermo, so there's something else it can yeah, do. Yes, so it has on the app, uh, right on the uh, inside of the chamber, it has a shroud on it where you can change the temperature up. Mm -hmm. And so that temperature goes from uh, minus 150 Celsius to plus 150 Celsius. And so we can simulate the the vacuum environment and the temperature changes that satellites have when they go in and out of the shadow of the Earth and they see the sun, they go behind. You have those difference in temperature ranges. Okay, and so all those things are there and from memory visiting, uh, there's a large, a giant clean room there that's all part of this. There is, so we have, um, we have large um, assembly rooms as well yeah. um, where um, companies can come and uh, groups, research groups can come and they can assemble um, satellites there too. And then there's also one little padded room that doesn't look dissimilar to this one, right? <laughs> That's right. What's that do? So it's called an anechoic chamber, and we I'm use that. I'm glad you said that word, not me. And so we use that to um, uh, either bombard a spacecraft with frequencies, radio frequencies, or to measure what they're giving off. Okay. So I'm going to be opening it up to questions here in just a second if people want to start asking questions. Uh, I guess... If you could pick one thing that you think is going to be really exciting over the next couple of years, what would can you pick one thing you're really really excited Wait, about? I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. <laughs> um, out of out of a whole bunch of many. Yeah, I'm going to make you choose. Oh, gee. Um, I think 
to be bold. I think Australia launching its own satellite to go up and um, whether it's to do deep space comms or as a demonstrator of new technology that's that's owned by Australia. Okay, so really doing our own thing. Yeah. So not necessarily on our own rocket or on someone else's rocket. It'd be great if it was our own. Yeah. Okay. But so, Anna, uh, you're a uh, a woman in what is seen as a very male dominated industry. Mm -hmm. Is it as male dominated? I mean, we already talked about a couple of people who have been women. So, what's what's the environment? If you're a young woman or a young man, uh, is it normal people doing this, or is it just sort of the weirdos in the back of the class that no one pays attention to? Um, Which I may have been. So I, I, I think if, if you grasp the whole community right now, you'd, you'd still see uh, probably less than 20% women in, in the whole industry yep. at best. Yep. And so we have a way to go. Um, the really positive side of space industry in Australia now, because we started it in a way we've catalyzed it more recently. There are so many more role models for, for young girls, yep. well, young boys and girls looking up and thinking, oh, it's completely normal, yep. uh, you know, to, to have that. And I, and I have to say, some, uh, there was a show on recently about the Australian space industry, and there were a lot of men on it. And I have three, three children, all three of them, two girls and one boy, 11, uh, 8 and 7. And um, all three of them at the same time, after about 10 minutes, turned around and said, where, where are all the women? Yeah. And it wasn't because they were annoyed about it. It was because they were used to seeing it. Yeah. And that's what I want to aim for. So if we, s when you start something new, in space is new, 75% of in space is women. Yeah. And it, w it wasn't even deliberately done. Yeah. I just wanted to make 50% 50 was already good for me. But I think once you give that avenue, once people see what you're doing is different and yeah. how it should be, then you, you kind of like, it just becomes normal and it becomes easy. Yeah, and so that's where when I was uh, jokingly talking about the weirdo in the back of the classroom, the reality is weird is just what you're not used to, right? Yes. So uh, it really is what you're saying is open to anyone who has an interest these days. Absolutely. So, well, it's better that it does. Yeah. That's my point. And it, it will it be It needs to have that yeah. broader input. And I could say that outside of space, but I'll just say space is my area. Yep. But you need to have those broader inputs now. All right. So uh, we're going to start looking uh, at some uh, some questions. So uh, Charles Wilson asks, how much longer do you think it will be, be before we have a functioning fusion reactor and stable warp core? <laughs> well, fusion reactor, though, we already got those. That, well, we don't have fusion no, reactors fusion. in space. We have fission reactors we have fission. in space. So fission reactors are, uh, yeah, plutonium cores that we use to provide electricity for some of the big space things. Mm -hmm. Fusion core, ooh. Well, we have stars, I suppose. Yeah, we don't you'd, even have a fusion want, core on, on Yeah, Earth you'd yet. want it on the <laughs> ground before you before we sit, see it in space. That's that's a little bit of a way off, but. Yeah. Um, and warps, yeah. so warp drives. Any optimism for warp drives? Uh, well. I hope so. Yeah, I have no idea. I, I don't. I don't. To make know. a warp drive work, yeah. you sort of have to fold space onto itself. And what you do is you go, this part of space yeah. gets clipped yeah. onto that one, and you can bypass that and just sort of take a shortcut. Uh, it means you have to have sort of the energy of the universe to warp the space. It's quite challenging. Uh, but anyway, here's hoping. Um, will Australia ever have its own space shuttle? Or. So let's space shuttle being a returnable spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So there, is, there are currently three uh, Australian launch companies yep. um, that are doing that are doing very well. So there's um, Europe, uh, Equatorial Launch Australia in Northern Territory. Um, there's Gilmore Space in Queensland, yep. and the Southern Launch in South Australia. And there's absolutely no reason why one or all three of these wouldn't be um, launching. Um, from Australian locations. Australia is a perfect place to do launch from. There's plenty of market um, with the l especially smaller CubeSats. So that, that cheaper, quicker into space and return, um, there's no reason why Australia can't be doing that on a regular basis. Right. And do you think that uh, 
the Australian Space Agency is going to, you know, have a profile in the future like NASA? Or do you think um, I, that bird why, has flown? Why would it want to? I mean, the, the space industry is, um, you know, I love NASA and I work with NASA, but um, but Australia needs something a little different. Yeah. And, and you know, the government wants to use space as, a, as an economic driver. Yeah. And it wants to use it so it trebles, um, you know, the um, space industry in the future, 10,000 to 30,000 jobs. So you can't, you know, that's a, that's a fundamental, um, you know, key performance metric, if, if you want to use that term, of the agency itself. It's intertwined into what our agency does. And so, so you've got to take that into account. So if, if the job is to create 30,000 jobs, that means there's going to be a bunch of little companies. And so it won't so much about be by the agency, but rather maybe, you know, Australian's version of Atlassian in software in in space that becomes a real global brand. That's right. SpaceX. That's right, exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, question, here's an astronomy question, but I'll answer it anyway. Very cool video a few nights ago. I saw the moon rising from behind some hills. I saw this in the day into work the, the other day. Got very red, got me wondering why does it turn yellow afterwards instead of staying red? All right, we're both it? astronomers. We can talk about scattering. <laughs> yes, no? Yes, we can. So, um, uh, so the atmosphere uh, uh, has molecules in it, that or atoms in it, which um, preferentially scatter blue light and not red. Yeah. And so what so happens is you got the moon, the moon, and its light comes here, and it the blue light gets kind of bounced out of the way, so you're left with red light. Especially when it's low on the horizon. And when it's on the low on the horizon, it's going through a lot more atmosphere, so yeah. a lot more of the light gets scattered. And as the moon rises less and less of the moonlight uh, is scattered and the moon ends up with its normal color. Interesting you call it yellow, it always looks kind of white to me, but it is reflected mm -hmm. sunlight and the sun's pretty yellow. So that is true. fair enough. All right. Uh, uh, the, re the real reason for latency is the line of users waiting for packets from satellite. Uh, with respect to, uh, well, uh, I, I, I'm going to actually disagree with you on this one. Um, the latency on the line of people using GPS, or sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the satellites at, um, you know, up at Equatorial, it's, it's literally mm -hmm. a multi-staged up and down. And so there really is a long latency there mm -hmm. that is theoretically impossible to get around. And you're right, you can add to that latency mm -hmm. by having too many people trying to use the satellite, and that'll just make it worse. But there is a theoretical problem um, of going any faster, well, having latency be better than the speed of light, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And nothing, you've got no tricks to get around that, I think. Well, but if it's, it's the speed of light to, to what's called a geostationary yep. belt, which is a long way away. Yep. So, you, so these GPS satellites and are often a lot of the communication satellites, they're placed in a specific orbit, which is called the geostationary orbit. Um, and if you place a satellite there, its um, velocity is completely matches the Earth's 24-hour rotation. Yep. And so it always appears over the same patch of the Earth at all times. And that's very useful when you're talking about communications. Um, however, there are ways today and in the future where you can have uh, what we talked about before, constellations of satellites which are much closer to the Earth. So the latency, there will be a latency, but it'll be much, I mean, hardly recognizable at all. So um, that's, that would be the next generation of communication satellites, and they're already going up now. Yeah, Starlink being Starlink's an one of the first, yeah. Again, do you think Starlink... Sounds like our space law maybe needs to have a conversation with Elon Musk on uh, Starlink. That's, hap that's happening, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's the Starlink ones actually aren't as, as much of an issue as the next gen that are going up mm -hmm. at a higher altitude. So the, so the ones that are in low Earth orbit, um, they travel so quickly that it's, and it's, it's really only when they're, at, um, they're illuminated by the sun at the beginning of the night, in twilight conditions, that you'll see them anyway. Yep. So for most of the time, you know, you don't really see them, but the ones that are higher altitude, the I think it's the one webs and things. I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm so sorry. 
technology, AI. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so the ones that are in uh, mid, uh, you know, uh, are in between here and geostationary, they are going to be noticeable for much longer periods of time. So right. they're, they're actually more of an issue for astronomy than low Earth orbit satellites. And what about, I mean, they're all using, ra a lot of them are not using laser links, they're using no. radio links. Yes. So Real one issue. thing for optical telescopes looking at, but if you're trying to run the square kilometer array, mm -hmm. all the radio signals presumably going to be a bit of a challenge. Yes, that's, that's quite true. All right. Um, so question from Bernadette, what is the difference between astronomy and space? Oh, well... Nobel Prize winner. Do you want to do no, that? No, no. This is this is your <laughs> hobby horse. So, so uh, astronomy is the study of the the universe. Um, you can do that from space, but um, it's a specific uh, study of the universe, um, which is pretty much anything outside of the Earth. So, if you're a planetary astronomer, you'll study the planets in the solar system and exoplanets. Um, if you would do what Brian does or what I do, it's much further away. But it's but it's a study of, of objects and processes in in the universe. Space itself is is a uh, that's a good question really. So so space itself to me is um, is the uh, environment that's above that's that's above the Earth's atmosphere, and uh, we can reference it to satellites and um, uh, human exploration. Um, we can study it, um, we can use it as a laboratory, um, so space is much more generic. Sort of about being it's out being beyond the Earth, yeah. in one case, and astronomy is, you might be beyond the Earth, but you're doing, looking mm -hmm. well beyond the Earth, as opposed Good to question. just being out in space, yes? All right, uh, question from Andrew is, how easy is it to launch a satellite? It's not easy. No. It needs to, so you need to do, you need to uh, get around something called the escape velocity. So that's several kilometers per second. So you need to accelerate something to at least that speed. And if you don't, your object's going to fall straight back down to Earth. So to be able to do that means you've got to, you know, impart quite a lot of energy into your satellite or whatever it is you want to get up there. Um, and there's some interesting ways of doing that. I'm sure the way we get objects into space in 100 years will be very different to what we're doing now, where we use fuel, you know, we burn hasn't it. Hasn't changed or, much in the first 75. No, it hasn't, but I think, I, I suspect we'll start doing things a, li a little bit differently. But yes, it, it is not, it's not so straightforward. You need to get that, what's called escape velocity. And getting escape velocity, it seems like a very large amount of rockets go kaboom, as near as I can tell. They, they tend to blow up at a pretty alarming fraction. Oh, no, that's, I don't think that's true anymore. I think it used to be, but yeah. I don't, I mean, the the success rate today of rockets going up is, is, is quite remarkable, actually. Not just rockets making it into space, yeah. but actually then delivering working satellites. So do you know what the success rate is now? Off the top of my head, I don't, but right I would say it's probably, yeah. I, I don't know, I've just met a lot be of over friends who lost their PhD thesis when their rocket blew up or their satellite right. did not get delivered. Mm. You will remember Hedy 1, for example, which I think I don't. Uh, is, did a gamma ray burst that never went up. Mm. Uh, Anna, given the opportunity, would you want to go to space? Yes. No, I do not want to go. <laughs> uh, why do you want to go to space? And I'll tell you why I don't want to go to space. Um, well, I, don't, I, I want to come back down again. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the caveat. I'll go if I can come back down. I, look, I, I, it's really hard to explain, I'll be really honest. I think mm. it's something that's inside of you, you, you kind of, you're born with, I don't know, but I've always. Do you like bungee jumping? Oh, yes. Yeah, see, I don't like bungee jumping ah, either. Right, right, right. And that's why I don't want to bungee jump, and I don't want to go to space. Oh, okay. Have you, have you done stressful. parachute jumping? Too stressful. Nope, You've never done a parachute. Oh, yeah, well, there no, you go. No, thank you. So. You're, a, you're an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> but I think that would be remarkable just to see the, uh, to see that we're at home and see how precious it, it is. I've talked yeah. to plenty of astronauts who have come back and, um, and just the experience they've had to see our home, you know, from the outside is fundamentally changed them. And to some it's kind of, it's been a bit too much. And to others it's just been an awe-inspiring experience and and I just I just feel that's something I'd love to see. 
Yeah, I think it certainly makes it a very clear that it's not as big as we think about it. Yes. it. It starts looking very finite. What do you see as the most likely game changer in defense satellite communications? That is a great question. Um, so for Australia, sovereign. So being sovereign able to do assets. our own thing? Yeah. And it, you, I mean, defense always works in partnership. Yep. Always. But I think being able to own some of some of our unique technologies that are globally recognized as being world leading and at the front at the edge. I think for um, for our industry to be able to stand up and say, uh, you know, uh, this is a unique sovereign asset for defense and defense owning that too. I think that'd be that'd be fantastic. And, and it will happen. It what is about happening. the so you could imagine very high speed quantum secure mm -hmm. type things, do you think that'll be part of it or do you think that's a long Definitely. way off? No, not at all. So I, th yeah. I think, um, so the technologies to be able to do this, some of them are here today. Yep. Um, some of them need a bit of investment in. Yep. Uh, things like quantum memory, the storage of entanglement and entangled information. Yep. But but it's not that far away. It's maybe 10 years away. It's not it's not, it's not like a warp drive, which You'll be glad might to be a little my, bit longer. My son is working on quantum memory for his, ma his honors degree oh, right now. That's, that's about the right time to be doing it. Yeah. So um, I think you can think of agile, um, multiple constellations, the use of artificial intelligence to get, to get really important information down to the, um, the, the forces, basically individuals. So I think it's all about having that quick response and agile information um, straight to the places where they need to be. So from Ruth, is it true that space is still governed by the rules made in the 1960s? I, I, th I think so. I'm not an expert on that, Ruth. Yeah. I'm sorry to say. Um, but I think that could, that could be true in places. I certainly I think can't think of anything new that's been done recently. Um, well, I think there's there's a lot of attention on um, protocols and um, and defining what they are. I mean, remember we're changing so quickly that the way space was done in the '60s is very different than what it is now. Um, yeah. So, um, so, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that's partly the case. There are a lot of people who are working to uh, bring that up to date, though. Uh, all right. Uh, how long until we live on the moon or Mars? Um, so uh, the U.S. has a pretty fast track plan to get humans back to to the moon um, by I think it's twenty four twenty five, which is think pretty we'll long term group there. Um, I think well, the next step isn't just to get humans back to the moon. Yeah. Right. The next step is to do it sustainably, and that that's tough. But it's that's that is genuinely the next step. So how do we do it so we can we don't take all of the supplies we we need to take with us because that is not a sustainable way to go anywhere. You've got to be yeah. able to mine in place to use the assets you have on the moon to be able to do this, um, to be able to live there long term. It's obviously a very hard, extremely harsh environment. So you're either going to have to go under the rock or you're going to have to have an you know uh, you know environment which protects you from the radiation and things like that. Um, but the next step is to do it sustainably. So I think within the next 10 years that will be done. And Mars? So Mars um, is, um, it is inevitable that we'll do it. If we but don't. the challenges are much greater. Yeah. And so that distance, it's just a, it's distance. And yeah. so even just surviving the trip from Earth, whether you use the moon to leapfrog from, You've got to be able to survive that two-year trip or one-year trip or whatever it is. Yep. Um, and so that's going to take a lot of uh, reinvention uh, in the medical community. And that's what uh, Australian the medical community, space medicine community is doing a lot of, um, especially working with NASA. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yep. And for our last question uh, uh, is, what is space medicine? <laughs> oh. um, so um, space medicine is, is a, the discipline of um, uh, um, making sure that humans can travel, live sustainably in space. So it's a harsh environment. 
Um, and so it's, it's not unlike, in a way, um, how we approached humans living sustainably in you know, somewhere like Antarctica, for yeah. example, another incredibly harsh environment. Yes, it's got air, thankfully, but, but still very harsh. And so it's kind of the next step above that. And so we need to do things differently. We need, um, so there's groups that are doing, um, uh, simulating the human body uh, in a computer and are able to, um, to see how it reacts as you do space flights, think of tourism flights and things like that. You know, the next generation of people going up into space, they won't be selected as we have done in the past. They will be selected, space tourism will be ba basically those that can afford it. Yep. A lot of the next gen of people going into space for the tourism will be people who can afford it, and that's not often the same people you might choose in the past. And so, well, how do we protect these, you know, how do we protect humans, go, the average human going into space? And so, um, so it's all about that. It's, it's being able to um, model and protect humans who are um, going into space and uh, the next generation of space travelers. And just to uh, remind people that people who spend a lot of time in space have pretty adverse health consequences right now. If you, like they have the twins, the one who stayed on the ground who mm -hmm. went on up there and they could measure the difference. And there seems to be not talked about, but there clearly are some uh, eye issues, mm -hmm. it would seem, for, for people who spent a lot of that's time right. up there. And well, he, uh, humans evolved to live on the Earth. And bone, that's, that's the bone reality. density. And, so, yeah. and who knows what will happen in a couple of years. So it's really quite remarkable. Yeah. All right, so we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, Anna, as always, uh, great having a conversation with you. Uh, on something of, I think, uh, mutual passion, uh, space and the space industry going forward. Uh, I think that we can look forward over the coming months and years. I mean, things are really changing, mm -hmm. bam, 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 really quickly. We're going to see a huge explosion of, of things, some, you know, stuff like we know, mm -hmm. some things that might well, our communications, just being able to communicate at incredibly fast speeds, being enabled by this additions to geo um, geos, uh, uh, to uh, you know things that allow our positions to be measured to mm -hmm. maybe even millimeters or centimeters rather than meters and all the things that that's going to be at that point car Amazing. can kind of drive itself mm -hmm. right it's going to be kind of a wild ride here for the next decade or two it is and my guess is like everything that changes over the short term won't seem very big but at the end of 20 years we'll look back mm -hmm. and say wow. wow. Agreed. It's a new world out there. And the really exciting bit is I'm a little critical on governments not being very visionary, but the government sort of got out in front of this and it's backed it in and said, this is the future. We need to be part of it. We're going to be part of it. And, you know, it's not actually that expensive what Australia does. Already a big industry. How many billions of dollars already? It was for... $4 billion in 2016. Right. So it's already big mm -hmm. and already more more money comes out of it than is put in. So mm -hmm. it, it's really a big opportunity. And so I don't often reach out to governments and say, well done. I'm glad to see we have the vision thing. Uh, and uh, I know that Anna and her team here at ANU and around the rest of the country uh, will, will deliver on that vision. So on that, thank you, everyone. And uh, I encourage you to be part of all of the events that we have on this week. Please uh, look on our webpage and you will see as part of uh, Space Week, uh, the range of events on everything from rockets to actual bushfires and space medicine, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. you.